There we go. Hey. All right. Well, good evening, y'all. Thanks uh, for joining us. This is kind of more of a work session. Um, you know, we're going to kind of roll up our sleeves and have a lot of discussion about um, you know, the proposal you kind of have in front of you and make sure we hammer it out and get it right for Manio. Uh, you know, make a lot of recommendations and do a lot. Uh, and from what we've learned about the town, but we rely on you all to really kind of temper those recommendations and, and make it really locally specific. So uh, we'll be doing that tonight. Um, to kind of start us off, we're going to do a little recap of the project schedule uh, and kind of the status to date and then <coughs> kind of get into discussion. So we could just a couple, like a handful of slides. Um, should we go around and say who's here? Do you want to roll call or anything? Or is there anything that I'm missing that y'all want to go over? I think we're okay. Yeah. Everybody's in attendance, but should be. Okay. So I'm Jay McLeod, uh, and this is Allison Evans, who you probably remember from last time. Next one, please. Oh, okay. Uh, so in terms of the project schedule, you know, we kicked off in kind of August, September. We're here in February. Uh, there's been a lot of research and, um, and uh, you know, building recommendations and plans and so forth. Uh, and then from here, we'll take it to a public meeting uh, and then I believe we're shooting for March 14th right now. Is that still yep. on target? So we're on target for a March 14th public meeting in this space, which would be kind of like that first public meeting we had, um, possibly with probably a, probably with a little bit of a presentation, kind of orient people a little bit more formally to the plan recommendations um, and, uh, and kind of deliverables, which we're going to go over tonight. In, in more detail so we have that ready so that y'all are comfortable with getting that ready to release to the public and have that discussion at that point and refine the plan further. Um, and then we're still looking then towards uh, formal public review uh, by the planning board in May and the um, commissioners in um, June. Uh, so the Quick schematic of the plan development process. You can kind of see how we're tracking. The arrow probably kind of points at both of those two boxes, those two green boxes, because uh, we are kind of getting close to the public review and comment period, a little bit more formal. Uh, if you want to slide past that a couple, just kind of walk down memory lane. Um, the community profile summary uh, basically, you know, we don't expect to have a lot of population growth in Manio if we look to the past. <coughs> To predict the future, you see about, I think, about six, 600 ish residents, perhaps. Uh, but obviously, that curve can be bent or modified depending on land use decisions that the uh, town makes, in terms of, especially in terms of uh, utility provision. Um, and so, that's kind of, I think, a big component of land use in Manio, in particular, since so much of it is built out and there's so few greenfield parcels left. Um, and you all, are, I think, are seeing that regularly redevelopment proposals or more intense development proposals uh, because it's still a desirable place. Uh, and you have, you know, it seems like a significant amount of uh, sewer capacity available, but it could be soaked up pretty quickly depending on if one of these big developments gets approved. Uh, Population is getting a little bit older, but that's nowhere different than anywhere on the coast in the United States. Uh, uh, the median income is a little bit lower than Dare County overall. That's also not too crazy because of your location and the fact that most of Dare County is beaches. Uh, and then, like I said, it's mostly built out. Uh, in the survey, obviously, we had a lot of concern for environmental protection um, and the character of the town, which is linked to the nature of the environment around the town. And then also kind of resiliency and making sure that we think about you know, how to prepare and plan for the, the changing future. Um, and then the next, uh, if you'll speak to the next one, to the next one. Thank you. Uh, the open house i think was really a profitable use of time um, i think we got a lot of great feedback and had a lot of great input and discussions um, there's obviously a legacy of affordable housing and walkability in manio uh it's a very you know it's a very desirable place that people really respect and treasure it uh, you know in their hearts even people that just arrived so it's kind of easy uh, but then also a desire you know to kind of make sure that still if you work here you can live here uh, if you want to push on a little further please uh, obviously, uh, the, the, it's changing, um, and this is actually one of the things you probably noticed in the future land use uh, areas that we'll get to in a little bit, is that the previous plan did have an, an acknowledgement of sea level rise and kind of used a 50-year 
horizon as kind of an area that they designated to deter growth in. And we kind of continued that, uh, brought that forward and just updated it for the future. Just to kind of orient you to those lines on the left-hand side, the lowest, darkest line um, is basically if you just linearly uh, extrapolated the tidal gauge rise that we've seen historically. So it's like absolutely has been happening for the last, you know, five, six, seven decades. And it, it definitely like that's the absolute lowest sea level is going to continue to rise. The one above that uh, is a slightly more optimistic view of humankind's ability to stop emitting greenhouse gases. Uh, the lighter blue one is an intermediate, and I think that's somewhere in the like, you know, 50, 50, 60% likely to happen. Uh, and then you go up from there, uh, obviously. So um, you can kind of see those curves, you know, the, the rate of sea level rise gets higher as you move further out of time. And, you know, 2100 may seem like a long way in the future, but this town has obviously been around for hundreds of years. And so, you know, in the, in, in kind of our planning and talking tonight about land use, yeah, 2100 is like the way distant future. We're not going to, we're going to go through so many more plan updates and revisions to the comprehensive plan before the year 2100. But uh, buildings are around for 50 years, buildings are around for 100 years, streets and pipes are around for decades. So as we you know think about that, we want to make sure we are cognizant of likely future conditions so that we can position the town in a way to uh, have the lowest burden and the highest returns, I guess, overall for public and private interests alike. Uh, next um, slide, please. Um, and then, you know, we've gone through the visioning process, uh, kind of updated the town's vision, um, dialed it in a little bit more, uh, and then the goals along with that. And so if you remember, we'll kind of the next three slides are goals, and I won't read them to you, but um, you can read them as we go, but if you remember, um, we want to make sure that the recommendations in the plan and the recommendations that are being graphically depicted in the future land use map, we want to make sure that ultimately what is being recommended can point back to trying to achieve the vision or one or more of the goals, right? If the community has established that these are the vision and goals that you know we see we want to advance in our community, then we want to make sure that we stand on those when we make recommendations for how to achieve those goals, right? So, and we can kind of go through the goals, um, you know, slowly. But uh, if, if you don't have these, I can, you know, rip up a sheet and pass them around as well. We have a hard copy. I mean, it's up to you. I don't think um, we necessarily. No, we made some changes at the last steering committee meeting. We just have incorporated those. Right. Um, yeah. And this was part of the packet I think that you sent around, wasn't it? Did we? Did you? Did you all get the goals and vision as part of the? Yes, packet? yes, yes. They are here. Okay, good. They're Sorry. they're um, okay. on the bottom of the page. It mm -hmm. says fifty three, I, but I don't know where it looks like this in the packet of stuff. If y'all want to, I'll make a copy. You guys, is this the draft recommendations? Uh, no, we're talking right now about the goals. Are, are, am I not using this correctly? Are you able to hear us? I can hear you. Oh, okay. I just have certain paperwork at home. Oh, and... It looks like this. Oh, yeah, I do have that. It's in the, with the maps. Okay. And I'm going to make copies for the draft. Okay. So I know we hit you all with a lot of information in the packet. Uh, there was the goals, the recommendations, the future land use map, a couple versions of future land use map. Um, they're just the same version, but one with the, the sea level rise kind of explicitly called out. And then the draft recommendations. Um, so really, I would turn it over to Allison right now to kind of walk through what those look like. And then we want to have mostly discussion with you all to talk about your thoughts and ideas and how we can better shape it for the community. <laughs> Pass it over to you, I guess. Sure. So as far as reviewing the goals, um, still the same nine hitting the high points that we hit before. Um, obviously stormwater and flooding is on top of everyone's mind, town character, um, and pr 
pre protecting that natural green infrastructure, the wetlands and the environmentally fragile areas um, that give the town its character and also make it more resilient um, to that sea level rise that Jay was talking about before. Um, if you just skim through the rest of them. Um, <laughs> sorry, I think I, I, we can look through them right here. I don't know why it's not moving. Um, uh, just the, the, the <laughs> here, just zoom in on this. I will hold mine up. <laughs> um, it's like my PowerPoint froze. Oh, yeah. No worries. I mean, this is you know, nothing anyone hasn't heard before. We've got the, you know, continue to implement design standards in the manual way. Um, very important in protecting that town character. Improve water quality in Shallow Bag Bay uh, within reason. So something, a point we discussed at the open house, I think, and among uh, each other at the last steering committee meeting that we know there's limitations to that goal, um, but it doesn't hurt to strive all we can in that regard. Um, we want to provide adequate public parks and open spaces while continuing to increase opportunities to access the waterfront. Um, that's a big CAMA goal as well. Um, we want to build and support affordable and workforce housing. Uh, that one, you know, was something we heard over and over again from the survey and from the uh, open house feedback. Um, it was, you know, the, the goal that was people voted to be most relevant from the old, old um, comprehensive plan that they still want to apply. Um, do not expand beyond existing sewer treatment capacity as a method of controlling growth. Um, working with Melissa, I think we're fine tune the wording on that one, but that is the, you know, will encompass a lot and definitely applicable to the future land use map. Um, and finally, we have expand opportunities to safely bike and walk to see neighbors shop and go to school. Um, so that promoting the connectivity and walkability within town. Um, so nothing new, we incorporated some of the wording changes that we discussed last time, um, but we think just a refresher on those will help as we go through the future land use categories and map. Two slides. Yeah. So getting into the future land use map um, and just a quick, you know, refresher for everyone on future land use versus <laughs> zoning, um, especially in this town. Uh, future land use establishes a vision for areas of town. It is um, not regulatory. It's what you'll be using, at, you know, when you review um, rezoning and other applications. And we know that you do end up seeing a lot of those here uh, with the way your ordinance is structured. Um, and then zoning establishes the rules for achieving that vision. That is your policy, your regulation um, that applies to these future can't future land use areas. Um, and as with the previous plan, most of these character areas um, that we're introducing and putting on the map are tied to a zoning district. Um, you know that make, makes it a little bit easier to implement, and also because things are so built up here, it doesn't it kind of avoids that confusion. Um, if you see some, there shouldn't be anything that drastically diverges from what's listed on the ground now. Um, but if we go through the character areas, you can kind of see our main goals from the previous map were to streamline them. You had, I think, about two more than the current number we're offering now um, in such a small area. It seemed, and there were a lot of overlaps between them. So uh, for clarification and ease, we combined a few. Um, we're always keeping those zoning districts in mind. So um, current one right now, um, slightly different color scheme, um, but you can see how we've combined some of them on the ground now, um, particularly around um, downtown. And we had that mixed use area, the orange and the, I think it was a pink before, it's very limited. Um, you know, that kind of structure we're seeing downtown you know, is a goal, um, is ideal for other areas in town. If it's good enough for the historic downtown land, you know, it's good enough for moving down the corridor as well. Um, so we've streamlined a few of the categories. We've streamlined those two and the um, uh, institutional and tourist commercial. Um, those were also very, very similar in their minimums and their maximums and their lot sizes. So we felt it was pertinent to combine those as well. Um, so for your residential character areas, they are you know, all referencing the existing ones from before. Traditional neighborhood was formerly the single family 
Um, mixed residential is uh, formally your single family attached. Um, that's the one where we you tweaked it a little. We diversified housing types and slightly increased density. Um, and that kind of supports those goals of affordable housing and infill. Um, you know, to support the greater vision of the plan. And then for multifamily, we slightly increase density. Um, of course, if you still have the um, ordinance with its building size limits and your, you know, the town has a lot of impervious surface limits. So we didn't feel that it was necessary to get too into the weeds for these. Um, you know, they're largely the same as they were before um, with the, those slight tweaks to achieve the goals from this plan. Um, and then if we go to our non-residential, um, your civic commercial is formerly your county services and tourist oriented commercial and institutional. And we, while we see the reason for having those two separated, they operate largely the same um, and their building sizes and lot coverage were largely the same. So we felt it was um, pretty reasonable to combine those. And you can see how that's been applied up and down the corridor. Um, general commercial, we changed it from Virginia Dare corridor commercial to make it a little bit more flexible, um, you know, because it's not only along the corridor. And we diversified a few housing types and slightly increased density. Um, many of character areas are really unique in that there's housing in almost all of them um, because you have that uh, allowance in your code um, for upper story residential and with the density bonuses. We discussed a lot of that with Melissa um, and how we can make a few tweaks and policy suggestions for making that a bit more reasonable, but um, we wanted to continue that effort to allow housing wherever it's possible, those incidental house units, um, you know, small apartments over businesses and the like. Uh, we thought that was a really great thing that you guys had and we wanted to continue it. Um, so that so that's why we added that into general commercial, but we still wanted to give keep with its commercial character, um, you know, as far as economic development and allowing these small businesses to pop up. Uh, we didn't want to discourage that at all. So still with that ground story, um, active use, retail, commercial use standard that it was before. Um, and finally, village mixed use was your downtown commercial and your mixed use. Um, the Biggest difference previously was the lot coverage standards mm -hmm. um, allowing up to 100% in downtown, which is from things that were built before Manio ever had a UDO um, and zoning ordinance. Um, we discussed, and it doesn't seem practical to have 100% lot coverage allowance in the future. Um, so we're adding recommendations. It's of course not part of the character area because, because those are not regulatory. Um, but we discuss, and that's going to have a guidance of a 70% lot coverage. Um, and even with existing stormwater standards, you know, it's probably gonna have to push to get that even. Um, so Mark will take care of that. But we thought it was uh, reasonable to combine these two because that kind of built environment that you see all around downtown is something, you know, that why, why do we not strive for that more? People love being there. It's, a, um, you know, it's a tourist engine. It's a, you know, it's what Manny was known for, you know, and if it's good enough for the, the couple blocks around here, it's good enough for to be expanded larger. So um, those are the changes we made in those non-residential categories. And finally, we have conservation, which is pretty standard your parks, wetlands, and ecologically valuable areas. Um, those are largely as they were. And, with, um, and then we have something that we've been introducing in other coastal projects we have, um, which is, you know, right now we're calling it a sea level rise overlay. And this is might be the biggest point of discussion um, within these character areas, um, but it's basically an overlay um, matching up with the projected 2070 three foot intermediate sea level rise scenarios. Um, am I saying that right, Jay? Yeah. Um, and it's um, within legal bounds, discourages development and, ex and extension of new utilities in this area. Um, you know, it's, largely matches up with, you know, the kind of the area that CAMA has jurisdiction over anyway. It allows for development of some things like docks and water access and, you know, to keep with those goals. 
but to really discourage development in these areas that are likely to be inundated in the future. Um, and that's what that second map was in your packet. Um, um, and there's, you know, a How different- How accurate would you try to make that sea level rise map? Because when I look at that, there's a lot of areas that you were showing that are okay with three level, three foot sea level rise, but historically, if there's a west, southwest, or northwest wind, they're underwater. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, you know, the future is a is a fuzzy place, right? Um, especially when you're talking about four or five different potential greenhouse gas emission scenarios, um, and you're talking about multiple time frames, whether it happens in 2050 or 2070 or 2100. Uh, whether you're talking about which way the wind's blowing and what the tide is, you know, it makes this, this differences that happen. But at the very least, we know, you know, we kind of carried forward the 50 year horizon from the previous plan. This is sensible. The sea level rise projections come from NOAA, but I think the bathtub model, so it doesn't take, into, it does take into account land subsidence as well as sea, relative sea level rise. So it's relative sea level rise, not just, just rise overall. Yeah. Um, but you know, whether it happens in 2060 or 2080, I mean, could you explain that? I'm sorry, relative sea level rise versus rise overall. Yeah, I found out about this like last year or a couple of years ago. It's pretty fascinating. Apparently, during the ice age, the last ice age, there was so much ice on the poles that it squished the earth a little, and the earth went, Rrr! and so now that we're like 30 million years out from an ice age or whatever, the earth is rebounding. So, particularly in like Southern Virginia and Northern North Carolina, the land is actually subsiding at the same time as the seas are rising. So it's, you get more overall rise. If you're sitting, you know, your toes get wetter if you're sitting in the North part of North Carolina versus South part, mm -hmm. pretty wild. Was your question the opposite though, of like some areas that look like they're fine on that map, but we know that they're underwater quickly. Well, I mean, we get a, we get a <laughs> yeah. storm surge three feet in right. underwater. Yeah, right, right. So. Yeah, I think putting them both together, you know, you know the anecdotal sea level rise, it, it, it's going to permanently creep up. But then you have the weather that rains sit in. So between the wind and the storm surge, yeah. so it's not this, it's, it's going to be more than three feet. It's, it's actually happen, higher. Say, yeah, in 50 years or 100 years here, but it's not going to be like at 99 years here and then in 100 years here, it's going to be slowly creep up take some days ago. Yeah, yeah, what will happen? happen the water, and you get the, the theoretical three foot rise, and then we get a storm with a three foot surge, mm -hmm. you know, six feet of water. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and we we talked about which uh, which model we used as an overlay here, and if you all think that I think we chose one that was like on the more conservative <laughs> end, right? Yeah. Well, well yeah, I, the heck out of I feel like it's a little more um, optimistic about what I would. Think humans will do. Yeah. So, <laughs> so if you is that all to think... say the, the like second line is kind of what the model is based off of that? Yeah, it's based on the intermediate. So if you want to flip that um, a little bit, and actually it's in the um, it's in the future land use handout also, <laughs> right? Yeah, next to the map. Yeah, yeah. It's the um, light blue one. Yeah. So it's like the third one up gotcha. in the bottom. Which is, you know, not, it doesn't, hopefully, like it won't freak everyone out and, you know, be perceived as so ridiculous that they'll throw out the idea. But I, I still feel like overall we'll see that it's on the optimistic side of, of what we can hope to see. And, and you'll notice, I mean, the areas that are in blue are mostly our wetlands. Oh, yeah. Um, well, and that's good. <laughs> when you guys um get done with wetlands i want to visit mixed residential if you, if you guys if we could sure. uh, i mean continue i just it's it's weird not knowing when to hop in on this but um i have great concerns with mixed residential because the density proposed for the neighborhood adjoining mine, which is single family homes, they're little tiny ones right now, is six to 12 units per acre. I almost croaked when I saw that. Um, and I think it would be pretty surprising to the little neighborhoods around me if we allowed six to 12 units per acre in here. 
Mm -hmm. Well, Nicole, so right now, um, you your density in Roanoke Village is higher than six units per acre. I'm not quite sure what it is, but the general standard for density across the town is six units per acre. Um, we had talked about, um, and you all, of course, tonight will be talking a bit more about mm -hmm. densities <laughs> per acre, um, but um, we had talked about what happens in a multifamily situation um, and maybe tailoring it so that if we were to go beyond six units per acre, then that would only apply to a multifamily situation. Right, uh, that, but we don't have any multifamily situations yet. And it would, uh, I mean, not that you don't want to have them in anyone's backyard, but it would drastically change the little tiny bungalow type houses that we have over here. Yeah. But also, um, if six units per acre were applied in Roanoke Village, you'd have a lot larger yards, less flooding, and less parking problems. And we actually... Well, yeah, but I think, yes, but I, I see what you're saying, but people that moved here didn't want to live in like a condominium or a apartment complex, so it's a different... You know, there are those available. And I understand, I'm not trying to say not in my backyard, but when I saw 12 units per acre, I was like, oh, well, that's. Um, I, I hope also, if you check a little bit further down, we kind of made sure that we carried through the existing lot size recommendation from the previous um, district as well, which shows a lot size of 5,000 to 15,000 square feet. Does that kind of help put your mind at ease that? If there were single family homes to move in, they would be in the 5,000 square foot lot kind of range, which would then be less than six units per acre probably. And that's if it was a future, that's if future land use was zoning, which it's not, but. Right. Does that help? So is it possible to make that consistent with, so we have a density bonus in our inclusionary, which it makes the minimum lot size 6,000. Okay. <laughs> I mean, one option is just to choose one or the other, you know what I mean? In order to kind of avoid stepping on zoning's feet, so to speak. But we can definitely bring it up to 6,000 if that's where you think, you know. Well, and, and to my it. point is, you know, when we go lower than that, we have, we have uh -huh. neighborhoods like Nicole's where there's a lot packed. Yeah, in. it wasn't, there were certain things that could have been planned better in here. Okay. Size is certainly one of them. <clears throat> I just noted the difference. I looked at general commercial and, and general commercial is 48 units per acre and mixed residential is six to 12. And I thought, wow, we're, you know. Yeah, yeah just slightly bumped up from the six to eight. I see what you're talking about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, some places we work uh, need to have their future land use map thrown out and rebuilt from scratch. But mm -hmm. it, we felt like Manio wasn't one of those places for a couple of reasons. One of them being that one, there's very little greenfield development left. Mm -hmm. And uh, your zoning code seems to do a pretty good job of maintaining the character as it is. And so mm -hmm. we really didn't see, you know, like kind of Allison outlined, there were some tweaks and some refinements, but we definitely mm -hmm. did not um, tear it to the ground and build it back up. Well, it went from six to six to 12, correct? In here? To eight previously, yeah. So, um, so and, and I'm just sharing this because my first go at it, this is the first time I've seen it. And I know the rest of us on the board haven't, this is our first go at it. So I would never just want to go approve it as is, you know what I mean? Or not, it's, it's time to put it on the table right now is what I mean. Yeah, that's Absolutely. right. I mean, it's it's this yeah. is the time to have this conversation about what you all think. So perhaps then, um, Nicole, like we maybe need a little bit of clarification there where if we're talking about single family or duplexes, we're looking at maybe six to eight homes per acre. But if we're looking at a multifamily uh, development, then maybe the upper limit is more appropriate. Is that does that capture your thoughts at all? To some degree. Okay. But I would not want my thoughts to be the only thoughts on this. I, I think Nicole's correct in identifying a huge 
red flag. There's a there's a handful of things that we know in you know on this island that like people go nuts for. Um, and anytime we see density increase, that is that is one of them for sure. So there's definitely something scrutinized. Um, whether it's right, it makes sense or not, um, it's definitely okay. something to pick apart. <laughs> so thank you, Nicole. Well, thank you all. I think it is, and I don't. I think people would be alarmed if this is what we brought at, before the public, and we, you know, and just what Jason said supports what I said. That's enough. Okay, you want me to move forward? Um, yeah, I mean, I think at this point we're really kind of in a are we to a discussion point yet, Allison? Yeah. A little bit, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, I think, yeah. yeah. Nicole, you got anything else on your mind? You're you're good. This at least residential in stood out a lot. Um, I well, actually had a whole. I tell you the truth. The maps, some of the colors on the maps, it, it took me a long, it took me a bit of time to scrutinize them because there's like peach and orange. And so, and also there's not enough street names on the map. So I had to, and it's my little town, but it took me a while to make sure I had the right neighborhoods and stuff. <clears throat> so I feel like the map colors are a little close. And I hope somebody else is gonna say something because I can't see any <laughs> <laughs> I was going to suggest that where the colors are close, that they go ahead and either cross hash or diagonal hatch on one of the others so that it differentiates. Yeah. yeah. Oh, excellent suggestion. That sounds good. Um, it's a pretty, you know, pretty generally accepted color scheme, but uh, we do have a colorblind color scheme we can use also. It gets a little garish, uh, <laughs> but you know, it's also more accessible to people who have colorblind parents. So we could definitely do that. With some of the shades of red and orange after you make copies for people. Uh huh. Right. Okay. okay. A little phase out, and then you can't tell the, the reds from the oranges and the tans. That's exactly correct. Yes. Yeah, I could put um, cross marks on, on them. Yeah. Diagonal hat. Yeah, okay. one of the reds or oranges would leave the other one solid. Good deal. Hey, um, don't hold back. I mean, y'all, this is, we're here to hear this. We're open to criticism. This is important. And if you have a list yeah. already made out, let's go through your list, you know, like. Uh, question, uh, from the beginning, you said something about population growth and that it's expected to be minimal. Um, what, what do you think that treats on the research? Uh, uh, yeah. Um, well, so uh, the, one of the requirements that Camel Amy's plan is a 30 year uh, population projection, which in, up until this last year was an interesting requirement since even the state didn't provide 30 year population projections for the counties. Uh, so it was always a challenge. But um, I think just because the nature of the town being mostly built out, there's really not enough, you know, every house you tear down. You might get one extra unit, maybe, if you build back, and it's expensive. So I think for the most part, uh, population growth will be limited by available land, the redevelopment costs, and then sewer capacity is, you know, not necessarily like looming as this thing that we're pushing up against, but there are towns in North Carolina that have no sewer capacity left, and they're basically have to just turn developers away and say, listen, we'd love to have you, but you can like tear down a home and build a home, but that's it, and that doesn't affect us. Pull up the map of uh, even, even the bigger ones here, like the old town. Yeah, come back one. The west side. Yeah. Um, yeah, my question was, yeah, I probably would have thought the same thing, but I just wondered because I saw some internet facts, you know, some mm -hmm. TikTok facts the other day. So uh, I think it was worth to put that. <laughs> and it was, I think it was totally, it was throwing out some numbers, you know, that probably hit it on the spot. But that uh, was, say, I think it was like 55%, a large portion of people in his industry that were. You know, used to work in offices or not going back to work in offices mm. post COVID. They like the work from home thing. So mm -hmm. I wonder how that would affect us if that would potentially, you know, to me, this is like a deal. Again, right? So they would want to move here. And then if that's the question, is, is uh, you know, as far as planning goes, which, where can we grow? I look at it from that. Where, where is the space for future development? Um, right. So 
Well, and I th I think this version of the map, the, the yellow line is weird. It's not the same up there. Yeah, uh, it's it's a weird GIS overlay. I've seen it before when we've done our zoning map before. So it's it's something that you need to do. I don't know hmm. technology things are. Um, so we don't have to maybe not talk like right inside our border, but adjacent to our border. Yeah, that's not There's actually in the. No, that's um screenshot of some of the previous. Oh, that's the current. So that's the current. Um, can we go to the proposed one? Because that's a, that's a seventy-five <laughs> foot buffer that was proposed in the previous plan. That's not. That line yeah, is not uh, relevant to this right now. At towards the end. Oh, sorry. Um, so uh, there it is. There, it's better. Yeah, I, I think from what I've heard, the office is not that um, more people will work remotely. It won't be like it was last year. Um, there are new developments in places like, uh, for instance, Beaufort that have pivoted and are now selling homes and building home, new homes with an office built in. So instead of being a four bedroom, it's now a three bedroom with an office. And like, that's how they're selling it. And they're selling it with high speed. You know, we've got a great setup for high speed internet or whatever, if they had it already in the town, right? Um, but for the most part, I think the people that buy those homes are actually displacing or buying up vacation homes. You know what I mean? They were previously vacation. So I don't think that, they're not necessarily like driving a boom in construction so much as displacing other people that happen to be relocating or something. I've seen a little bit of that some vacation homes that yeah. people bought into, and then smaller homes turn into the DRBOs and the Airbnbs. Yeah. Do you? Yeah. I I have a question for how maybe do you see? Do you think you're seeing more? Permanent year round residents than for the people that had a vacation home, there's a certain percentage of them that have come down here permanently now because they're working from home. Yeah. In our neighborhood. I, I feel like, especially, so um, we've had some things that we've had to work through in Pirates Cove lately. Um, so I've been back there in and out quite a bit. And I feel like for the wintertime, there are more, people, more people this winter than people there have been. There. No yeah. About it. And uh, the best way to pick up that change might be through the wastewater um, consumption uh, or potable yeah. water consumption might be the best way to track that. But again, we're talking about a year's worth of data and we couldn't hang the population projection on. I mean, hopefully this thing goes away before 30 years is over, yeah. right? The, <laughs> uh, the, the outlier with the wastewater data is that um, our numbers are, are lower because we've had such a drought that we have so much less I and I. Mm -hmm. um, so. Right. Yeah. Same with water or something. Oh, good point. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, certainly people are, yeah, certainly people are relocating, you know, maybe not permanently, but maybe for a couple of years. I mean, if you plan for limited growth and, and, and you have more than you expect, it's not bad. Yeah, it's not. Um, I mean, ultimately, it's your wastewater treatment capacity that's going to govern, be the governor. Yeah, in my neighborhood, that wastewater treatment capacity was already figured in because those places are all fully occupied in the summer as rental homes. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, it's just a case now that people are there year round. So the actual usage was up, the capacity was set aside for that. But now mm -hmm. you know, what's being used is probably increased. Right. And I would imagine if, um, Unless y'all have some special arrangement that is new and unique to Manio, uh, when they permit new development, it's probably using the state's 2T rules, which are pretty conservative overestimate of how much uh, wastewater gets used by particular uses. And I think for a single family residential, it's like 250 gallons per day. Minimum. Minimum, right. And, and that even that lines up with the water saving fixtures and things that people use and so forth. Even that, generally speaking, in my understanding, winds up to be an overestimate about like 50 to 70 uh, gallons per day. So even if, for instance, we permitted like X number of new homes and we used up all of our capacity at the wastewater treatment plant, we probably still wouldn't be at capacity, right? The wild card is, you know, it. no projects could happen around town. And then there are, you know, some that could come that put significant, you know, there's not a lot of space, but there's, the space that's here where they're going There's, to put a lot you know, of you put, large parcels that yeah. still haven't if, been developed. If, uh, if all of them happen, you know, then you've got these, you know, 
higher density um, housing places going in, you know. The five plus per percenters <laughs> in wastewater. <laughs> Yeah. What is the zoning for the Scholars Green? What is the zoning on the proposed map for the area that came before the board as Scholars Green? Village mixed use. So um, a good example is we passed a, a parcel on our right hand side as we drove in. 4.6 acres, uh, fronts on the highway, backs up to the marsh. Uh, right next to the Christmas shop, right? Um, it, it, yeah. it might be 4.6 acres. It's not. But it's not dry, 4.6 oh, dry oh, acres. Oh, it's oh, like oh, yeah, half an acre. Is developable. Yeah. Right. So if you look at the um, proposed future land use map with the inundation overlay, the sea level rise overlay, I think that parcel gets teased out pretty well, um, if I'm not mistaken. I'm not mistaken, but I mean, that's one of the things to consider with the sea level rise overlay. Uh, and I want to bring it up because I want you all to understand the nuance behind it is that the town already has pipes and roads in places that are going to be underwater and they already go underwater once a month or every couple months. Um, it's really hard and really expensive to pull those pipes out of those areas and leave those people stranded uh, and for good reason. So the sea level rise overlay doesn't affect things that exist, right? So those people are going to be dealing with those problems and the town's going to be trying to find solutions for many years and that's fine. But at least what we're doing is saying, okay, but for new problems, let's not make new problems. <laughs> so that's like, that's like the line we walk, but at the same time we say, listen, but there are alternatives. So let's say you own one of these pieces of property that is going to be underwater. It's not saying you can't do something with it. It's saying maybe we don't want to put like a preschool there or a hospital. But if you want to put a single family home and you're going to build way up out of the floodplain, okay, but we're not going to run our sewer line right up to you. Like you're going to have to have a long driveway and run your own sewer line all the way back to the main road where we already have a pipe or it's high and dry or whatever. So that's kind of the, the thought there is like, it just hopefully gets, keeps us from getting in deeper and worse than we already are, um, which in Manio has limited effect anyway, because most of it, like I said, is built out. We've got like what, three sizable parcels Maybe left in town or adjacent to town that could Bruce, conceivably can you, enter. Can you zoom in on that map that's up there right now? Can you zoom in like on the Arvilla Lane area? Um, I don't think I can. There's a bigger version right behind me. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but it's going to get confusing with this shirt on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you look at the Arvilla Lane, it's going to point to um, <laughs> I don't think you can see it that kind of strip on the west side of town. The big green strip that goes out. Oh, uh huh, uh huh. So when you say like expansion, so I guess to the left and the right, north and south of that are not in the town. That's correct. Right. Yeah, they are kind. That's their town. But when I'm thinking of expanding the town, I'm thinking of that the, that street. Yes. With single family homes, what are they? They're about six, seven thousand square foot lots on there, aren't they? Yeah, they're they're between six thousand and seventy five hundred. I'm picturing that continuing north and south of four or five streets. Mm -hmm. When I think of future expansion, so I guess right. when I think of future expansion for the town, it's actually outside of the town. Right, now. right yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yep. There's a there's those are some of the major parcels right there, absolutely, that are likely, I guess. Or um, and I'll note there's one that's in town, this big red one. Mm -hmm. Um I, I think that might be five-ish acres. Yeah, that's good on that. Um where's that at? It's as you turn left going home onto California. It's the wooded area. That's in town. Oh, the wooded area on the right-hand side mm -hmm. where the old radio station is. That's right. Okay. Um, but I, that, I, I'm pretty sure that that is the largest parcel be that is undeveloped. Yes, it'll be developed. Yes. So maybe general commercial isn't the best label for that area. Um, Maybe traditional or mixed residential is a better label over there. I think so. It should just be residential. Okay. What's that sound? That's an odd. It sounds. 
but no it's so it's it's b2 but it is the only parcel in town where uh adult oh that plot i'm talking about our bill of lanes our bill of lanes are part two on the old son of matt rod yeah yeah that is right it's its own zone i know that's our sacrificial adult establishment parcel. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> when you when you run the math and the special uses <laughs> category, that's the only parcel mm -hmm. like away from churches and schools mm -hmm. and things. That's the one that um, it applies to. <laughs> Everybody so has. maybe that's why y'all decided to go general commercial. <laughs> Every town has one. Yep. <laughs> For Jennifer Gold, mm -hmm. won't be in that. Uh, well, <laughs> she starts banging the flag on the floor. <laughs> the the now deceased one of the the owners of that parcel had a very colorful um, past with the town. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Well, uh, any okay. So. We can step away from the map if there are no other ideas on that and talk to the recommendations. I want to ask our resident map expert if I'm putting you on the spot. What do you what do you see on their fields? Huh? Well, because you've got an eye for maps. You're the you're every map I have I send to you <laughs> that needs approval and you always find something. So okay. Okay. You're always quiet. I, I got to put you on the spot sometimes, especially when we're talking about maps. I'm going to ask you guys to look at those mixed re residential carefully. Um, just look at those and just make sure that people would be, let's just make sure that would be what the citizens of Mania want. Well, they don't want to don't have a pick. Say that again. They don't want it to adult entertain people. Oh, right. Good question about uh, goal number eight. Uh huh. I'm a big proponent of that, that sewer plan is our wastewater plan is our biggest asset and what makes us have the ability to have government and control a lot of things. Uh, so, definitely, I mean, that's our biggest asset, obviously, we can preserve that. Uh, the, the wording is a little bit strange. Do not expand beyond existing sewer treatment plant capacity as a as a method to control growth. Sounds like we we're going to keep the plant at this level because we don't want any more growth past that. Yeah. Is that, and is that the, the feeling that we don't want? I mean, no. If the developers came in and were like, "Well, I want to develop this area, and I'll pay for the expansion of the plant that's necessary." That's why when we were when Allison was going through it, she said, "You know, we were still tweaking this. This is a, a hard one." Previously, um, I'll stop the share. I'll read to you what the relevant goal was before. Um, I don't know that y'all know it off the top of your head, but um, it, it wasn't completely different than the way it's stated now. This, but but we had agreed the last time that we needed to make this one better. So, bring your best suggestions. I'm just thinking that we have. Uh, we have a wastewater plant with, I guess, eight employees, I believe, and you know, the plant it costs X amount of dollars to operate. And then I think last time I heard about 1,500 water bills. So that might not be right. But if we went to 2,000 water bills, it would cost the city more to operate the plant, maybe not much more, but then that cost is spread out. So there is. There is some room for growth there, so I guess more like maybe manage that growth. Yeah, well, the, the logic kind of went like this. You know, we heard big time in the public meeting and in the survey, small town character, we love this town, we don't want it to get crushed, we don't want it to turn into, you know, something that's, that it's not. And let me tell you right now, the best way to do that is to not have so much sewer capacity that people can build condos. Mm -hmm. Uh, or, you know, multi, you know, because I don't care how tight your development regulations are, at some point, 
it's going to seem like a great idea to build a seven story condo or hotel or whatever, unless it's physically impossible because you don't have enough sewer well, capacity to get the seven story will not happen because we have height. Well, you do now, but it only takes one council and you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's the easiest part to change, right? The sewer plant's the hardest part to change. Yeah, but we do have the alcohols in the bay that have a permit. Six hundred thousand gallons. So six hundred. Six hundred thousand gallons. So we probably could not get a permit to expand that. We have to have some type of other. Engineers can do a lot of stuff if yeah. you give them uh, some money and a little bit of time to figure it out. <laughs> you are correct in that they their their highest stated goal goal was to keep it a small town, and that's why I hate to be the driving force behind the mixed use, but it it runs counter to keeping it like a small town. And I, I realize there has to be some, but that's that that's what the stated, you know, one of the top goals for the citizens of Mania was to keep the small town nature. Yeah, I understand. I guess the, um, to make the change, the logic with the mixed residential was to provide some sort of housing diversity that wasn't single family or the apartment buildings that you see in Pirates Cove. Um, it was imagining something in between with, within the same building heights and lot coverage specification. But we can knock that down. We just tweak with it. I mean, we can just, if we could just tweak it some, I think most people would be okay with that. I can't, it's hard for me to tell. I can't see the faces of everybody else. I'm just sort of guessing, but we can't hear. Everybody has a we're, but we're nodding. We're, Alice and I are nodding anyway. Thumbs up. <laughs> nodding is good. I've had worse. <laughs> I've had worse responses. So if y'all look on the screen, number eight, um, it's it's the same number even in the existing land use plan. It says limit growth so it doesn't exceed the wastewater plant's current capacity. We we had kind of tried to switch it so that we were talking about capacity, but I, we, we had all agreed last time that where we were with this wording still needed to be improved. Yeah, I would, I would say the difference to me is that one says, let's not oversell our plan and then have to upgrade our plan at great expense to our townspeople. We're like, looking at it from the, the growth standpoint. Like, you have to use the sewage treatment capacity. You know, if you oversell it and have to expand it, it's going to be. I like what I, I like what you just said. Utilize the sewage treatment capacity. Sewage treatment plant capacity to to control the growth. There you go. Or manage the growth. Manage the growth. Yeah. The way this is worded, it is kind of. Yeah, I agree that both could be improved. Okay. <laughs> same time, same. What is it? Same bat channel, same bat. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. One more. I feel like I'm asking a lot of questions. This is our, obviously our plan. Yeah. Like, be like, why did you do this? And then you did this at our request. Uh, you do the term of their affordable housing, which it, we use a lot at meetings. Is you know, everybody wants affordable housing, but then I think everybody in their mind has a different opinion on what that is. You mm -hmm. know. Um, and so I think that so I talked to people with some HUD numbers, and I guess that was about thirty percent of your gross income. Is what they consider affordable housing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So someone making uh, about thirty thousand dollars a year would be seven hundred fifty dollars a month. I'm making fifty would be twelve hundred fifty dollars a month, and like so, be a family income. So, you have two people making thirty to sixty would slice that. Um, how do you word that in there? Yeah, I mean you're right. There's there's a lot of definitions for that, and I know Alice will chime in a second. HUD obviously mm -hmm. uses thirty percent of annual median income, and then they have standards for very low income and very high and so on and so forth. And then uh, another group took it a little bit further and said, it's not just how much you spend on your housing, it's also where you live. And so you need to spend 45% of your 
income or less on housing and transportation costs, right? So then you count in the commuter costs, which makes sense. Um, and then, then you get into the split between like, is it affordable housing? Is it like subsidized housing? Is it workforce housing for like firemen and teachers and police officers and stuff? Can they live in the community and so forth? And that's no, not term. affordable work, necessarily. Work, work workforce work, housing. Now, who, is, who do you consider workforce housing? Workforce housing is like, you think about the people that, you know, make a town run. Okay. Right. So yeah, like teachers, can your teachers afford to live in your town or do they have to live, you know, off the island and then, you know, drive across or whatever? Which probably the teachers are living here, driving over to the to the um, you know. Beach Somebody side. else called it central housing. Not one of them. Because <laughs> yeah. I think I think when the outer banks, we might think workforce housing meant summer so and college yeah. kids and J one visa type. Uh, you know, uh, they'd be here for four or five months. That type of housing. Right. Gotcha. So and I I, me, I mean. I that's the big wrong. distinction yeah right <laughs> i'm wrong a lot of us here might be wrong but we're using that using the term wrong but, and know. to jamie's point i sent you and you all brought up the parcel that is what we call the former weeping radish site mm -hmm. um we <clears throat> sorry i don't mean to laugh but um we recently saw or received an application for development for that parcel that um skirted our density rules it was basically going to be an unsupervised college dormitory with no <laughs> yeah that's the one with yeah. the five people in in room. In Four, in college, yeah. though. just college age right. <laughs> right. or not or, or not, not. Oh. yeah party um, house yeah. so i i, I sent that to you, you all <laughs> just now or just a few minutes ago so y'all can look at it to get an idea of, of the kind of development pro proposals that are i think um kind of at the at the back of our minds that are maybe um triggering some of our thoughts that we're sharing with you you know like these really good point that's such a good point melissa yeah what we've been inundated with lately county project didn't even come to the planning board but just went straight to the county they just wanted sewer allocations they just wanted a big right. chunk of that sewer yeah well they're not in town and they don't want our zoning to apply so they wouldn't come to you all because the no, the sewer the, but yeah, yeah that's like that type of that the thing that like projects that may or may not happen because that that could happen or not and it could involve getting annexed or not and then is it you know now it's adding it down yeah i guess so uh trying to figure out how do we this is where your you guys expertise come in it's how do we you know, encourage the things that we want to happen. You know, like say maybe put putting numbers to that or or, mm -hmm. or your your exclusionary yeah. ordinance, so you're miles ahead of other towns. Uh -huh. Um, you know, in terms of providing essential housing, workforce housing, attainable housing, um, for letting the buck out of vocabulary. Yeah, like that. Um, yeah, like that. Attainable housing. Because you guys are right about you know the developers want to build everything and. You know, this group knows, you know, we can get, we can all get too well. Yeah. Lately. <laughs> we got the sewer capacity and they're coming in here one after. Yeah. Well, and they hear, they hear that we operate at 50%, but what they don't realize, I don't think what that then realizes is that that means we're only 20% away from the 70% where we have to yeah. demonstrate so something limited. to the yeah. state. Yeah. 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 And you don't get 100. It's not 50 nope. of 100. It's 50 of you 70. Don't, you don't build for 100, <laughs> but you don't get to use it. Yeah. Well, plus they don't have sewage on the beach. So they, they when they're looking for projects like that, they go, ah, oh, Mania, they have sewage. They can do high density. Well, okay. We can, but we don't want to. Theory, yeah. We have the ability. Yeah. Has that change to the lot coverage bonus proposed in the recommendations? Um, I don't know if that would. Yeah. So I I suggested um, last week when we reviewed these on a staff level. Um, you know, there is a huge incentive that is offered in the ordinance that gives 70% lot coverage to, and this is not, this is, think about outside of B1, so not that necessarily downtown, because that has its own set of rules. Um, but like with the Saga project you all are going to review tonight, you know, 
they are they are allowed by the ordinance this incentive, which is 70% lot coverage if they have the residential above commercial. Um, and I know that that incentive was offered to encourage that kind of development. But when we look at it on these plans and we receive it, you know, it, it kind of feels too dense for Manio, I think. I mean, I, I think a lot of people have agreed with or have, have shared that concern with me. Um, and so I mentioned it to Jay and Allison last week that, you know, it, are we on the right track there? I mean, do do we want to fill <coughs> that in? Do we will do we do is the will still there for Manio to have this policy to incentivize that huge amount of lot coverage that all, uh, uh, gives us projects like Salt Meadow Landing? I think probably before we were here, that might have been when, when you wanted some growth, but I. I think now growth is limited, has to be limited. I mean, there's not much left. And I don't think the town's people want that type of growth. And so that's the feeling that, that I, I would get. eliminate the 70%. Yeah, because when you allow that, the other issue that you get into with that is now you're creating a traffic jam. Get, get moving out of that site or even a couple of the other sites that are available because you have that dense development. It just is going to create gridlock when everybody's trying to get out and go to work at home. We're in the or, summertime or in a rainy day going to the aquarium. Yeah, and when it's back up the back to the project, you've got commercial in there, so you're going to have people trying to get in and out of there all day long, as well as during the rush hour period. And so, you know, as we've seen some of these development applications that have not necessarily gone one way or the other as per the, the developer would like them, but we hear the concerns about it, you know, th this is an opportunity for us to kind of take that deep look inside about whether or not we really, the, these policies are um, suitable for us still. Um, and, you know, to the point of sea level rise, like adding all of those units. And I mean, it, it, it well, appears to- Well, lot coverage is that much more stormwater going on. And adjacent to that area that is gonna be inundated first. Um, so it's just, it, it's, a, it's food for thought that I offer you all to think about. Um, Cause I, I don't know, but when I see some of these things that come across and we allow that, um, if there's an interest, we, we should talk about it in the land use plan. So moving forward, when we change our ordinances, it's there. Might be too late. Well, well for one. <laughs> well, and it, I mean, moving forward with that change could promote some hurry up on doing things right as they're, you know, instead of trying to continue to be greedy and get more and more and more and say, oh man, I better get this done now um, with, with what I can before it gets cut in half. I think it'd still be the right thing to do. Yeah. It is to eliminate it entirely? Yeah. What's, what's can I have now? Like on a single thing with residential, it's 30, 3 percent lot coverage or something like that. Very part of the circuit. Um, in the AEC, there's a number for the. It, it, it depends on the the lines. There's there's 35 foot and then there's 75 foot lines. Yeah, I know most of most of the area in our neighborhood. Yeah, yeah, probably so. And I, I mean, and your lot coverage would be thirty-five percent maximum. So the the ordinance, the the lot coverage for the for single family homes is pretty close to what Cama's regs are, but this. 
big increase when. Oh yeah, uh, when you have the mix. The yeah. Commercial downstairs and the residential upstairs, then you go to seventy percent, which you know, not a lot for the area. And then what's the uh, stormwater retention? It's uh, only one and a, so we talked we looked mm -hmm. into this so it's one and a half inches now. Um, which what was when at the time I think it was forward thinking because it, at the time it was ahead of what the state required but now is equal to what the state requires. So I had I had sent an email um, asking the so coastal an hour one half an inch an hour or no, that's for a storm twenty four hour period uh, twenty four hour I think that's what it is and. and in January, I know we had two rainstorms that had that much of the We had almost two inches of that much storm a couple of weeks ago. And I'm finding it right now if you want to put on there. So, draft rats. And all that does is the stormwater pond overflows, it goes everywhere. Yeah, under better water quality. What do you call that, Phil? You're an engineer when you better have that. water quality. It's that well, two, small lot, it's a little bit of a problem, but. By still size lot, it's four times as much of a problem and exponentially more Back water. Share. New share. New share. So, well, I mean, you just do the runoff calculation and it depends on the calculation based on inches per hour of rainfall. And that's so water quality. You know, that, you know, here you're only held to an inch and a half. Or, you know, the total storm is an inch and a half. Of rain, but I forget yes. how many inches that is, you know, fractions of an inch that is per hour. There you go. And you have to be able to control it because what happens when you get more than that, then it just inundates the entire parcel. Let's see if I can get both. Okay, jump on. Okay. Right. So right now you all capture the um, one and a half inches of the one year 24 hour storm, but the recommendation is to capture more. Uh, that would require a change to the you know stormwater ordinance. And we actually just kind of carried that forward. I mean, we talked about where we were with that. It seemed like it was a good recommendation then and probably still is now and possibly even more relevant. Small last question. When you talk about affordable housing and you look at these numbers, do you assume that for rentals or for purchase or both? Or... Um, well, you know. What, what is the question? We Sorry? use the, the term affordable housing or essential oh. worker housing or attainable housing. And then if you're going to use this 30% or 45% of housing and transportation, you, if you have that number, do you assume that that's to, to purchase a house or to? Okay. Um, we were not using the word in the HUD definition. We were using it as a way to support the town's existing inclusionary uh, affordable housing ordinance. Okay. Yeah. So not, um, maybe we need to clarify that. Um, so that would be the affordable housing ordinance is, to, is for purchase. The, I think it's just for construction. You get a density bonus for including, um, you know, units below a certain price. What's the threshold that you all use? Oh. So then the developer could either sell that or rent that. Right. Well, the It's more complicated than that. <laughs> so it. Uh, so it, there, there is a section of that ordinance that talks about covered um, development projects, like projects that fit into that. And if it's, they're mostly for sale. So if it's a rental community, it doesn't, the inclusionary ordinance doesn't apply. And I know you're looking at me. Like, I, I am I, speaking I, Chinese, but it was um, flats and um, but behind TLs, they're all single family homes. They are. That's, that's, that's so, my yeah. Experience with it. So, and so the question was think about a development that was trying to apply it to a rental. It doesn't apply to rentals. That's good to know. That might come up today. Um, that will come up. <laughs> Affordable unit price shall be determined by calculating 72.5% of the median 
income multiplied by 3.5. I have no idea how we got there. <laughs> but it's less than the median income. <laughs> yeah, they're spending 33% of their income on the house. You're supposed to buy a house that's three times your salary or something uh, like that. Uh, the, uh, um, Melissa, I wanted to slip something in. I tried to turn my mic on. Yeah, it's probably loud. Um, the Board of Commissioners tasked us with adding minimum housing standards to this. So I don't want us to forget, forget that too, because we don't have them right now. Yeah. This happened last week in our. Oh. Okay. What? Um, the. You mean just yesterday. <laughs> was it yesterday? Not yet. No, it was last Wednesday. Last Wednesday? Mm -hmm. Last Wednesday. No, oh, yeah, yeah. That was, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they all run together. Um, yes, there is a concern regarding some housing units in town mm -hmm. that have fallen mm -hmm. beyond. Right. In, no. Yeah. And we do not have a minimum housing code. And oh. so it was suggested that. Um, we look at doing that as as the first step of being able to do something. We also have not developed it, but the board was thinking about this last year when they did the budget. Um, and there is a little bit of funding that was provided in order to leverage grant dollars for um, a program that, again, we have not implemented yet, that would be called Operation Safe and Dry, which would allow for property owners to um, but it, the idea was those would be match dollars for like CDBG grants, mm -hmm. and then we would be able to uh, we would be able to provide property owners with grants to um, replace the underpinning of their home or you know diff different things, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. HVAC units or mm -hmm. elevate. Uh, well, I mean, we could probably leverage that money to get some mitigation dollars, but we typically do that as a partner with the county. The county does those applications. Yeah, state program that the county applies yeah. for to elevate the properties. I think the county should just buy a house elevation team, and just send them around one house at a time. I mean, you know, y'all got the need in this county. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, and, and I think they have about 35 that they're about to do. Yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> this is the opposite. We're going to go up. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, so, so they they we have two in Manio that are included in the next round that the county's doing. Cool. Yeah. Um, so to to the point about minimum housing, though, um, I don't quite see which goal we might kind of house that under. Uh, but uh, maybe you know we can certainly include it in the plan. But the the reality is also is that a, a thing doesn't have to be in a plan for us to do it, right? Sometimes good ideas are just good ideas and it's just taking care of business and we just do it uh, as a town. You know what I mean? Like it doesn't, just because something's not in the plan doesn't mean it's not a good idea. It doesn't mean it should be done. I think it can fit in a couple of places. Okay. Too, though, you know, where, I mean, keeping affordable housing, putting the, uh, quite literally a floor on it, you know, where you can't just be a slumlord, and, you know, I mean, just have, somebody living in district pair. It's also um, design standards and character, you know, maintain the town's character when you've got things that are, uh, I mean, it's one thing when they're unsafe, you know, and falling apart. I mean, that's that's no longer um, something that is you know, reflected. In that case, building inspectors go in and condemn it. Yeah, I mean, that's true too. So it's kind of- That's, that's um, easy to fix, yeah. but the other is more difficult. I know yeah. our neighborhood has in a restrictive covenant you have to periodically the property manager will walk through yeah. and send people a letter if they've got spots where the exterior paint's peeling or the bushes yeah. aren't trimmed or the lawn's overgrown. And it's a fine line between, you know, cutting your grass and your your house is ugly and uh yeah, well, the, the, you yeah. know versus that it was yeah, I don't like the color. Yeah. But yeah, right. some of them, especially down here where the fascia boards start to rot and the paint's peeling off. 
you know. But, but to your point, there's some pretty clear health, safety things yeah. that building code addresses and we have minimum standards. I'm sure you could just get your building inspector to go into a place that looks substandard. And if they find violations, they can start to enforce on those. Well, you have to have a hearing and there's a process for, you know, extracting the property or money or whatever and putting a lien on it and all that, but the process. And, and the, the town attorney explained that to, to be able to do any of that, you have to establish the minimum housing code, which we don't have. So that's that was his suggestion of the first step forward. Okay. To... We'll find a place for it. Thank you. That's yeah, that would be helpful to everybody. Sure. So is the commissioners mostly in favor of oh I'm generally there speaking? seemed to be a consensus, yeah. yes. I mean oh, there okay. and and yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, don't wait on us. I mean, you know, you'll lose three months. <laughs> If it matters. <laughs> it's going to take us some time to get there. Yeah. Yeah, it, it is a process to it. It can take, you know, over a year or more to condemn a home. I mean, if it's in really bad shape and you have a really unwilling uh, homeowner. Okay. Did you want me to scroll through this? The other oh, uh, no, I just thought just that one in particular. Okay. Uh, any other thoughts maybe on the recommendations as, since we're kind of in that world right now? Uh, do you all kind of understand the structure of those, how they kind of go through the camera structure first and then we have kind of at the end a bucket of things where probably where the minimum housing will go in that bucket at the end is like, and there's other things we care about that just don't happen to fit in a camera structure. Okay. Why don't I start at the top and just scroll through? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think when when did y'all's next meeting start? Okay, so probably one of five minutes in between to change. Yeah, we've got to move the table. To okay. Um. Um. Yeah. So, do y'all have any uh, concrete plans on creating additional public waterway accesses, access points, or anything? I didn't think so, and we like to keep you know, Camel likes to see that as a continuing thing and staying open to those ideas, but. Um, you know, some towns will go ahead and make a waterfront access plan where they're like, listen, here's some places where we're underserved. We'd like to see an access here. Here's a street where the right of way dead ends into the water. Maybe we could, you know, clear a trail and put a bench in a trash can and sign it so that it doesn't just get a boat parked in front of it. Three boat ramps, the county's longest board walk, two kayak launches. Yeah, it's got, it got some pretty good access in a lot of places. Absolutely. Yeah, although I'll absolutely. tell you. This would be a pretty ideal. Yeah, that would be a place great spot. Because it's hard to access this with a kayak mm -hmm. because the launch is there. That would be a great spot. I mean, even just reorienting the parking and the boat ramp there at the bridge so you could park a boat, a car with a trailer on it would be a big thing, I think. Um, and, and I think because the town had focused so much on that waterfront access for so long. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of the access, the CAMA access grants that we get are just maintaining what we have too. Okay. I mean, that's- It is great. The last one we got was, I, I think 90, it, it was nearly a hundred thousand dollars that redecked a lot of our boardwalk. That's a great boardwalk. It's a gem for sure. Uh, the land use compatibility obviously deals a lot with the future land use map uh, and protecting resources. Infrastructure uh, carrying capacity. We will look at rewording the beginning of infrastructure carrying capacity based on the um, goals, the goal rewording that we just did. We'll look at making sure we get those aligned properly. Are we on the CAMA or non CAMA part? We're still on the CAMA. We can skip yes. ahead. <laughs> no, I just had, I, I feel like we're so pressed for time. Um, I uh, was looking at stormwater filtration and that's under non camera. Is it under natural hazard area? Uh, Related. Let's just find it. I've got all my pages mixed up now. I'll tell you the truth. I just spread them all over here. I got all my stuff before the meeting started, and I get thinking and put my mind back on the table. 
Okay, we're there. We're, we're there, Nicole. It's so, under water quality. Yeah, water quality. So um, I would think it would be valuable to map where we already had runoff filtration and then identify hot spots where we could either um, add commercial filtration or green filtration. So I know that we have created some, I know we did some rain garden type, there's like a rain garden type thing, um, or I'm not sure what you call it, across from the front porch. Rain garden. It is a rain garden. Okay, it is a rain garden. And then we have some filter, actual filters in downtown area, correct? Storm oh, we have oil grit separators before, yeah, yeah. So perhaps to put some, and I know there, there's green filtration that you can add too. Um, and so to add filtration in hot spots that run off really close to the sound, I just think would be valuable for Manio. Map what we have and, and look to add at least a little bit every year. We'll check it out. And Nicole, I know you feel you said you feel like we're pressed for time. If you have other thoughts um, on these that you want to send to me and I can discuss them with Jay and Allison, um, you're certainly welcome to do that. And or if you want to come um, visit with I'll me, be, I'll, I'll be out of quarantine this <laughs> time around. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. So we can we can certainly whatever thoughts you have, we can relate to them um, in some fashion or another. Thank you. Sure. That color is all coming up. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank y'all. Yep. Yeah. Same goes for everyone if you have more thoughts. Right. Yeah. Right. I'll be the reciprocal for those. Y'all y'all let me know and right. we'll get them to them. And so yeah, so this is a draft of the recommendations. They'll look better. But this is just a word document at the current moment, but um, we'll be adding detail. We just want to make sure we're getting y'all's eyes on it now so we can refine it moving forward bring it to the public and, and get it report. Um, thank you so much for your time this evening. Really appreciate it. I think it was really productive. Yeah. Thank you. And Nicole, hang on. We're just going to rearrange the room and we'll be back with you, okay? That's okay. I'm going to run to the ladies' room while we do that. If that's okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
Um, if it's, it's commercial, is it more, um, is it different construction? And it's not really a setting and zoning issue. That's a good <laughs>
Oh, hey, do I have a different link or something? Did you start calling me? I just well, turn your microphone off. Mm -hmm. Two years of uh, control. Yeah. All right. Before sharing this, I'll mention this. Okay. The time is 6 p.m. And is everyone ready to begin? I'd like to pass the gavel to Hal to begin this meeting. All the meeting to order. Is there a motion to adopt the agenda? I'll make the motion. Motion oh. on the floor to adopt the agenda. All those in favor? Is there a second to the motion? Oh, sorry, I'll second. Yes, sir. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Chair Approval Goodman. of the minutes of the January 11th meeting. Chair Goodman. Yes. Y'all haven't done a remote meeting in a while. I'm not sure if y'all did one when we had to do them, but uh, you do need to do your votes via roll call since we're considering this a remote meeting. I'm prepared. I'll call the roll for you. Yeah. Chair Northrup. Present. Member Daniels. Present. Member Goodman. Present. Member Scarborough. Here. Member Stemple. Present. And what, what I was saying was, when you vote, you've got to do a roll call vote. And when you make a motion, you, the statute says you got to state your name before you do it. So if y'all could do the, do the best you can at that, we'll follow along. Okay. Uh, is there a motion to approve the minutes of the January 11th meeting? I'll make a motion to approve the minutes, Nicole Northrup. Do we have a second? I'll second to your score world. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor of uh, approval of January 11th minutes? Aye. Aye. Wait a minute, we got to do this by name and roll call. Nicole Northrup? Aye. Jamie Daniels? Aye. Field Scarborough? Aye. Dave Stemple? Aye. And Hal Goodman? Aye. Minutes are approved. Now move to a period of public comment. Members of the public are invited to address the planning board. Comment is not intended to require the board to answer any impromptu questions or take any action on items brought up during the public comment period. Speakers will address all the comments to the board as a whole and not to one individual member. Discussions between speakers and members of the audience will not be allowed. Time limits are three minutes per person or five minutes per group. Please identify yourself so that your statements can be recorded. And if you would please press the button on the bottom. Oh, it's on. Go ahead. It should be on. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Good evening, members of the board and staff. My name is Sheila Garrison. My husband and I are resident property owners at 106 Peninsula Drive which is lot nine in the Peninsula subdivision adjacent to the proposed Salt Meadow Landing development. I'm here tonight to offer citizen and adjacent owner comments on two staff report agenda items under old business. Each of the items involve applications by Salt Meadow Landing OBX LLC <clears throat> on property adjacent to the Peninsula subdivision. All property owners in our subdivision are vested members of the Peninsula HOA which owns and maintains our roads and common areas, including Peninsula Drive, 
which begins where Russell Twyford terminates at the frontage of the proposed salt meadow landing development. <clears throat> Excuse me. First, we appreciate and applaud the detailed staff review of the uh, permit application and the site plan. And given that the project is within a B3 entrance district, we ask that the application moves through the process that the emphasis be placed on the district stated goals, attracting historic tourism and creating village atmosphere. We ask that a detailed architectural render rendering and a robust landscaping plan be required. <clears throat> to ensure the overall aesthetics of the development will meet the stated goals of the B3 entrance district. Additionally, we support staff's recommendation to the planning zoning board to recommend denial of the zoning text amendment application to allow 12 units versus the current six units per acre in the B3 entrance district. Again, we support the goal for Manio gateway districts to have a, both a historic and village feel. And we feel that to promote the targeted tourism, the development proposals should meet the stated intent. Again, the relative land uses, architectural style, or aesthetics and amenities consistent with the historic tourism. An automatic doubling of density by, by right within the districts would not ensure consideration and compliance with the original purpose and intent. Thank you for considering this input. Thank you. Are there any additional public comments? Hi, my name is Kathy Wasakis, and um, my husband and I, John, uh, live here. We've been full-time residents for a while. We also live in the peninsula down the street from my neighbor, Sheila Garrison, and my other neighbor, Jennifer Parser. Um, I um, would just like to add that I see did not see anything with respect to a traffic study. The traffic going out of Russell Twyford is horrendous. Last week, in its February, I had to make a right-hand turn because the traffic is so is so robust coming from the causeway and into the government center and turning around. I regularly have to do that during the summer months, but I just had to do that last week. I think that any kind of expansion beyond what has been authorized is unconscionable. And, and I truly think that town needs to look and um, North Carolina Department of Transportation aggressively need to address the already existing traffic problem that we have. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Good evening. I'm Jennifer Parser. Thank you for allowing me to speak. I'm also a full-time resident in Mantio and live in the peninsula. I think that um, a traffic study is absolutely more than necessary, even in our current state of inability to make a left turn uh, out of Russell Twyford. I know that the earlier iteration by Saga um, was going to have so many cars a day of about 500. And that was when it was just residential. Now that it's going to be mixed use with um, retail establishments and places to eat and drink, uh, it's, going to it's going to add not only the commuters that live there, but also ongoing constant flow of traffic for those amenities. Um, lastly, I look at the village atmosphere of Mantio downtown and realize that people have been hurt by the lack of retail space um, being filled, um, that businesses have closed. And I ask that you respectfully ask that you consider whether or not more retail space should be allowed to the detriment of downtown, which is what people come to see when they visit Mantio. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Anyone else? Seeing none, we'll move into a period of old business. The first item is review of the special use permit application for Salt Meadow Landing. And Melissa, you wanna give the staff report? Yes, sir. So um, staff are in receipt of an application for a special use permit for the Salt Meadow Landing development submitted by Salt Meadow Landing OBX, LLC. Um, 
the special use permit application was attached to the staff report for a mixed use development located at zero Russell Twyford Road. Um, I note the parcel number because that is not um, a specific address. Um, the special use permit application is enclosed with an updated site plan um, dated January 18th, 2022. Um, adjacent property owners were notified by first class mail of the application on December 7th, 2021. On December 7th, 2021, um, planning department staff reviewed the site plan with the following members, the town manager at the time, um, water and sewer director, public works director, building inspector and fire marshal. As required by town of Manio zoning code, um, the planning board is required to review the application for a special use permit and shall submit its recommendation as to approval or disapproval, along with any additional co conditions or safeguards that may consider necessary to the town commissioners. At their December 13th, 2021 meeting, the planning board voted to table their review of the application until updated information was provided on the site plan. Um, this was specific um, because the site plan provided um, topography data from 2004. On January the 11th, 2022, staff met with Mr. Gupta, with Mr. Hauser and Mr. Strader regarding the proposed Salt Meadow landing. On January 18th, 2022, staff reviewed the updated proposed site plan and document responding to staff notes. Um, the site plan provided um, meets the standard of the ordinance and the applicant has acknowledged the previous staff plan review comments and made appropriate updates and responses. Um, staff would note that on sheet four, the lighting and landscaping plan does lack some detail related to the Roanoke Voyages corridor um, buffer along Highway 64. Um, upon review, staff inquired with Mr. Gupta and he has agreed um, to improve in the, uh, the landscaping plan in that area. Um, staff recommended a buffer similar to the buffer installed at CVS and I, I took a picture of that landscape plan and um, cut it below on the staff report in case um, you have not seen that. Um, and so staff, based on the review, do recommend approval um, to the Board of Commissioners for approval of the special use permit application. And um, I know that um, we've had, since I wrote the staff report, there have been, um, there's been a concern related to the density calculation, which I'm sure we will have a healthy discussion about um, this evening. Okay. Thank you. Is there any anybody on the board have any comments they want to make before we get into the discussion on the density? No, no sir. I really think that uh, there should be a traffic study done. That that intersection is really bad, especially uh, on a rainy day when the aquarium's open. I mean, traffic's back all the way up to Pirates Cove somewhere. So I really think that a, a traffic study should be done. No, I'm in agreement with you there. And I think not only the entrance on Russell Twyford, but where you're coming out onto the causeway on the other entrance they have out of the site. That, that's before the uh, deceleration lane to make the right turn in front of CVS. And uh, you're going to have people flying down through there at 50 or 55 miles an hour and I, other I, people trying to get out. I think that entrance should be one way in and not an exit, which would yeah. solve that problem as far as traffic coming right. out on the causeway. Well, the other issue that you'd have, though, is they need to put in a right turn deceleration lane to be able to get in there without getting rear-ended. Yeah. Um, but I, I agree the, the whole thing creates traffic situation that's not good. I'm in total agreement with both, with what both of you said. The traffic really concerns me. Well, so what does that entail to get a traffic study done? Is that DOT? I, I think one could be done privately. Um, I am happy to share with you all that I have emailed the site plan to DOT on December 9th and February the 2nd um, as a courtesy, which is something they had asked for me to do a long time ago for any developments that are adjacent to their roads. Um, I haven't received a response from DOT, um, but it would require the, the both driveways and the work that is proposed to be done for utilities um, 
that exists underneath Russell Twyford Road would all require encroachment agreements from DOT. So there is a permit associated with this project that DOT will need to approve. Um, I'll defer to the town attorney on the, the ability to require a traffic study since I don't know that it's required by ordinance. If it's not required by the ordinance, it may be a condition that the commissioners could point, put on the uh, special use permit, but I'd have to investigate that a little bit further. Thank that you. Was, that was my question. Thank you. Well, she had, uh, uh, sorry, four, four points there. First one being density, the other three were, uh, if density is going to be increased as a lot size decrease from 7,500 square feet, uh, well, I, so I that that was actually in the on the next matter, the zoning text amendment. That's not for this site plan special use permit application. Oh, okay, yeah. we could talk about that on the next item of the agenda. Well, on review of the plan, I noticed that there's 34 dwelling units, and going through the calculation for the bonus that you're allowed and the normal six dwelling units per acre, uh, the 34 actually exceeds what the allowable would be. I think the calculations show the allowable would be 30 units and there's a total of 34 shown on the plan. Uh, yes, we reviewed that quite a bit yesterday. Um, I, I agree that with, with eight, affordable units that the maximum is um, 30 total units. However, if they increase the affordable units by four, they can get to the 34 units. Yeah, that would require a, a change. Yeah, but the only change would be to that they would drop four market value. Prop, uh, Correct, and have to, to go with four additional affordable units. Correct. And if you all have further discussion points, um, we can continue to do that. But I, I do want to note and offer the applicant or his engineer the ability to present to you all. Yeah, that's fine. Sounds good. Take it away, guys. Hello, good evening. I'm Sumit Gupta, rep uh, representing the applicants. And here's Mike Strader with Quibel. Uh, first of all, I wanted to answer any questions you guys may have, Miss, uh, and also just make a few points. Uh, this property, um, you know, the site plan we brought was something that was previously approved, and we tried to stay within that. It went through the special use permit and actually to site plan approval, and um, it had all the DOT permits, stormwater, everything back then. Of course, we know this is uh, some time ago and we're going through the process again, which makes perfect sense. I do want to emphasize that there's still several parts of the process uh, beyond the special use permit that we're going to have to go through, uh, be back in front of you, I think more than once with this complete site plan. We have to go through all state <laughs> permits. So as far as a reference of a traffic study, uh, it's some, certainly something that we're open to as a condition. Uh, it's something that I think it makes sense uh, for a development of this scale. Uh, but I will also request that we got to get to a certain point when we, we're definitely going to get into architecture and everything. All this stuff costs good money and these studies. So uh, once we, you know, if a special use permit was granted on this, um, still a lot more homework that we need to do on this on this property and that would be the next steps of it as far as the density again it's something that um we i know mike can address that more he, he um but, you know, from our least interpretation of the ordinance how we got to the 34 units um i do want to emphasize that for this may be coming into the next thing of our request to go to the 12 units. Uh, currently right now, you can do 12 units per acre. You can, you have six units. If you make them, 
affordable or inclusionary housing, you can get six more units. So you can go right now, the way the ordinance is written uh, to 12 units and our plan with the tax amendment, because in a way it's related. And I just wanted to just at least mention it was uh, some of the condos on this plan are 2,600 square feet. And um, without changing any of the building footprints, um, if we were allowed more density, some of those can go down to 1300 square feet, which probably are more appropriate for sizes for condos. Uh, but that's where that was coming from as well. And we were limiting that to the B3. Uh, again, I know that's the next um, application here, but there is a tie to that on um, the reasoning where we were requesting it. Good evening, members of the board. My name is Michael Strader. I'm an engineer with Plymouth Associates and I'm the civil engineer of record for the special use permit application submitted before you this evening. And um, I, I just felt like it was important to note that as you heard in the staff report, the applicants proposing um, seven mixed use structures and that includes a total of 34 residential units. I'll get into the, the density in a moment. Um, I think it's also important to note that at that point, a conditional use permit application package was submitted. It was reviewed. It was approved by the town. Um, this project has not changed from that particular project. And at that time, we also had obtained all the various state permits and approvals from all the regulatory agencies. It had even gone to the point of preparation of construction drawing. So it was ready to go to construction. Obviously it did not. Um, I, to your point, I, that conditional use permit has since expired. So that's why we're here before you today. Um, let's see, as far as the, and, and we have corresponded with each and every one of the applicable regulatory agencies and each one has concurred that those permits and approvals will, will be reissued upon the approval of a special use permit. And, and at that point, we would solicit those, those permits and approvals once again. Um, and that does include the, the NCDOT driveway permits and encroachment agreements, all sorts of other state and regulatory uh, permits. Um, the couple of points that, that the town manager had brought up that have come up since um, since the staff report, the density, um, let me go over that density pretty quickly, but we're following chapter four of the town's ordinance and the, the proposed project that I explained before is, it is on 3.6 acres of upland area. So the ordinance allows that six units per acre. So at that six units per acre, over that 3.6 acres, a total number of units of 22 is allowed. Um, the applicant is proposing to take advantage of the, the allowed density bonus that's allowed in section 4.6 that allows for one market rate unit to be incorporated for each affordable unit. So a total of eight, a total of eight affordable units are being proposed to allow for that, that additional. So for those eight affordable units, there would be a one-to-one, -one, eight additional market rate units. Um, so that's 26 of the market rate units and eight of the affordable units. That's a total of 34 units. And then as far as the, the there's a, a minimum 20% and of the eight over the 34, that that's, it will exceed the 20% minimum. So 23 and a half percent would be affordable units. I, we can probably talk about that in more detail later. Um, and as the town manager mentioned, yes, the applicant's very much aware of the need to enhance the corridor. So that is something that, that the applicants agreed to do and, and will do so willingly. But I'm, I'm available to answer any technical questions, the applicant. Mr. Gupta is here to answer any other questions that you guys may have for us. Thank you. Anybody have any questions for him? Ben, Not right is, now. Is, ben, is that interpretation of calculation for the uh, 
density correct? Sadly, I don't get to decide what is correct and what isn't. Somebody later might decide that, but in my opinion, it, it's not the correct way to read the, the ordinance. Um, it, Mr. Strader is correct that it is a one-to-one -one ratio of uh, bonus of market value to affordable units. However, what they're doing is really one and a half to one because they're they're adding an extra four. And if they had added one to match the other four that they put in, then they would be doing a two to one. It It's hard to tell, it's hard to explain in an audience perspective, but, and it's not just section four, um, chapter four, it's also chapter 11, which is the zoning code, which is why we're here today. The, the language of the two provisions that are relevant are identical, so it doesn't much matter. But I think what happened was when the project was originally approved, and I think Mr. Strader would agree that they've basically done the same calculation they did the first time. And I think there was a mistake when the project was originally approved by melding the requirements of the 20% uh, affordable housing with the density bonus. And I think those are separate issues. I think no matter how you build the project, you've got to have 20% affordable housing um, on or affordable units, whether or not you take advantage of any density bonuses, which are a separate concept, because someone could have a someone on this lot, for instance, could build uh, instead of doing the maximum 22 units that would be allowed without the bonuses, they could do 10. So they'd only have to have two. But that's a separate requirement that you look at at the end. How many are you putting in? Do you have 20%? Okay. The requirement for the density bonus is what it says is a density bonus shall be provided equal to one market rate unit or lot for each affordable housing unit or lot. And we can drop the word lot out of there. So it's one to one. So every affordable housing unit that, that they put in, they get to add back a marketable housing unit because they're taking away an initial housing marketable housing unit by making it affordable. So they get to add back one. It's a one-to-one -one ratio, just like Mr. Strader said. But I think the way that they did the initial calculation, again, was a confusion of this 20%. They, they took that 20% and said that that four doesn't count and that only the other four count. And I think that's, that's not right. You, you look at all the, and it actually, if you had enough property and had enough parking and other things, it probably gives you a, 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 a broader uh, density range, but it, in giving you a broader ultimate maximum density, it also increases the amount of affordable units, which is the purpose of the bonus. So my interpretation is that in order to have 34 units, they've got to have 12 on this parcel, they've got to have 12 of those units be affordable uh, units. Thank you. And not to start an argument amongst yourselves, but you have a uh, maximum density of six units per acre right now. But they thought it was a bonus of an additional one if it was a affordable. So, so I think that they seven could, units per acre. So I think they could double, they could double their their un, their total units because of a one to one. You can replace each one of the market value. If you have a, a density cap. How do you do that? That's, what, that's my question. What's the density cap? Six units per acre. That's the density cap is without the bonuses. The whole point, of, the point of the bonuses is to add on top of the cap. The affordable. Yes. So, so the, the bonuses the, are all affordable. They're one to one to affordable. So you get, you basically get a market value. You get a market value unit back for each affordable that you add. Or you can just add, either way you can look at it. Mathematically, it comes out the same. You can just add affordable units up to a certain Sounds like point. for so, so many units, you get an affordable unit. And then when you add that affordable unit, you also get an additional market you unit. You don't get an additional because you're taking up a, to, so you've got an initial 22. They're all market value. And then each one of those that you take away for to make it affordable, you get to add a market value back. So basically you can, you can double your density by doing the affordable if you wanted to. That's the maximum you could do. 
you can double your density if they were mm -hmm. all affordable yeah so if you filled in so be easiest if we had a bunch of cups or something yeah. right so you could fill in <laughs> so you got 22 cups that are all market value units and you put a ping pong ball in each one you know in four of the cups then you can add four more cups that are empty market value units so the ones with ping pong balls are affordable ones the ones that are empty are market value ones you got 22 empty you fill in four you can add four more if you if you wanted to that and that's the point is you don't have to add those four more that's why the 20 percent is different maybe that's where i'm remembering differently thank you uh other question i was looking at site plan and um keep going back and forth and going back to the special use permit you can explain the difference melissa because you recommend approval of the special use permit between a special use permit and the site plan for me and everyone here so the, the site plan is associated with the special use permit application um and i have i, I know that you probably haven't i've got it on the screen now yes ma'am okay um what do we approve when we approve the special use permit well you are making a recommendation to the board of commissioners who then will hold a public hearing and well, then they'll, they'll have a quasi-judicial hearing to consider the special use permit application. So you all are making a recommendation to the Board of Commissioners. But so what's the special unit? For this development. And then the site plan approval is separate? Um, I think the site plan that's presented here is to provide the information necessary to make the zoning determination and then the, there may be a separate site plan approval a deep a more detailed site plan approval is that your expectation mr strader yes i at that point we would like to have state permits in hand so that you see that we've demonstrated compliance with everything okay we got to figure out where to go from here because the plan as submitted meets the current requirements for the uh, special use. Uh, the question is, what do we do about the density? Because that, you know, according to the calculations we've done, that does not meet the current requirement, but everything else on the plan does. Any recommendations? Melissa, what choices do we have? <clears throat> um, <clears throat> ultimately to recommend or not recommend, but uh, I was what what other issues you have he's well, gonna... do we wish to correct the density? Is that a sticking point for the board? Uh, you all could do you all could could recommend an approval with with the updated density calculations corrected. Okay. Anybody want to put a motion on the floor? I'll make a motion that we uh, approve the special permit. Special, special use, use permit. permit. Special use permit with the change in the density corrected. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, motion from Dave Stemple to approve with the density corrected, seconded by Field Scarborough. All those in favor, Nicole? Aye. Jamie? No. Fields? Aye. Dave? Aye. And I'll say aye. So it carries four to one. Next item of business is the zoning text Thank amendment you. for the B3 entrance district. And Melissa, do you want to go over the details on that? Yes, sir. Let me flip through all of these pages. Okay. Um, so similar to the last application, the timeline kind of tracks the same, um, except that um, Prior to the meeting where this was going, this, this zoning text amendment was going to be considered, um, the applicant asked that um, it 
be held until this meeting um, to go alongside of the special use permit application. Um, the applicant is proposing that the density be increased from six units per acre to 12 units per acre um, by replacing the word six with 12 in three places in article 9b3 entrance district. Um, there are currently 12 land parcels located in the b3 entrance district that this would apply to. Um, um, Staff's review um, is that the proposed text amendment is not consistent with the town's comprehensive development code because it proposes a higher density than six units per acre. Uh, the density requirements included in the town's ordinance are a tool in how the town's uh, how the town manages growth and wastewater treatment capacity. Um, staff have recommended to you all a denial of the zoning text amendment application, um, and that is before you for consideration. And if, again, Mr. Gupta, I was going to ask uh, yeah. if, if you wanted to comment on what your reasoning was for requesting the, the 12 versus the six units per acre. Thank you again. So, as I mentioned previously, right now, the technical density can go to 12 units per acre. If you did six affordable, you would get six more market rate. Um, the intention of this text amendment, and maybe it needs to be crafted a little better here, but was to do 12 units market rate. And if this were to be approved or something considered, uh, the idea would be to go back and look at this site plan again, and we may come back before you guys. Uh, right now, there wasn't enough residential density to support this development, uh, which uh, called for the commercial on the ground level spaces. And we would look to pretty much reconfigure this site plan. And uh, our intention on this property, even though uh, this is not specific to a site, but within B3 on this particular site, we would look at a uh, reduction of some of the commercial and the goal would be to do 12 units per acre and do more residential um, luxury long-term rentals. Um, that is the intention because the inclusionary housing really focuses on for sale. And uh, so that's the intention of this uh, tax amendment while we ran it together. Um, so if that was again, something considered, we would re look at our site plan for this particular property and do more residential and potentially less commercial. Thank you. Anybody have any questions? Any discussion? I agree with Melissa. Go ahead, James. Uh, so you go ahead. I just I think going from six to twelve is just too much. Sorry, I can't agree with you on that. Jamie. Yeah, I mean, I have my own opinion, but we also have our, like I say, our comprehensive land use plan. And as Melissa states in here, that it's inconsistent with the with the planning of the town. So I'll go so far as to make a motion to not recommend to the board of commissioners to change. Okay. I'll second that motion. We have a motion by Jamie Daniels, seconded by Nicole Northrup. Any discussion on the motion? I have a consistency statement to read, and if you want to amend your motion, yeah, after I, I motion read to that. include your consistency statement. Uh, the Town of Manio Planning and Zoning Board finds the action to amend Article 9, Entrance District of the Manio, Town of Manio Zoning Ordinance to be inconsistent with the Town's 2007 land use plan. The proposed text amendment is a deviation from the town's density rules. The density requirements included in the town's ordinance are an important tool in how the town of Manio manages growth and wastewater treatment capacity. The planning board finds the action to amend Article 9, Entrance District of the Town of Manio Zoning Code to be inconsistent with the town's land use plan. Per this citation is wrong, the state statute. Um, 
In a blank to blank vote, the planning board recommends to the board of commissioners deny the request to the town zoning code with the proposed language for Article 9 entrance district. You want to amend your motion to include that? Yes. <laughs> okay, we have a motion on the floor from Jamie Daniels, seconded by Nicole Northrup. All those in favor of the motion? Nicole? Aye. Jamie? Aye. Fields? Aye. Dave? Aye. And aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Move on to a period of new business. First item is review of building plans for lot 30 in Marsh's Light. If you would bear with me just a go second, ahead. I'm gonna yeah. pull those. It's no, important to see these Take plans as we do this. Let me switch gears here. Thank you, Ben. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. All right. Uh, I can show you one to GIS too. I'll pull that up as well. Right next to it that backs up to the marsh. It's a flat block. I mean, they're not going to have any yard to speak of. It's going to sit way full with the other houses. Yeah. Yeah, I went over there and looked at it. Somebody's yeah. got it staked out. Um, and to answer the question, I'll just go ahead and show you all this, the view. Um, it, it's a very small lot. I looked at it Sunday and uh, the house has to sit pretty far forward of the other houses in there. Almost up to the sidewalk. Well, I don't know if you noticed the house next door, they put in a concrete pad right off the front yes. porch steps that they park yeah. on. So the, the, the land area of the lot is um, 10,500 square feet, but it does include um, quite a bit of yeah. wetland area. Let me... Um, yeah, the, the right-hand side and the rear are all wetland. Let's see. Let me new share. Okay, so we'll start here. This is the um, area and you'll see that you can see on the that's, map and we've talked to the core when when the house adjacent to it was. Um, yeah, there's a house on that lot yeah, now. Your, house. There is. And so you can see the the lot has the, both of these lots have been well maintained. You can see the change in topography. Um, so this is the buildable area of the lot. And of course, there's a, a significant portion of wetlands there. Um, those are not CAMA, they're not wetlands under CAMA's jurisdiction, but the Corps of Engineers. Yes. Um, okay, so I'll stop sharing here. And there we go. Okay, there we go. So, um, I will note for the members of the planning board that the chair of park is here today, Ms. Benson, um, and she can help elaborate if I don't get this right. You know, typically, um, well, I will start by saying February and March of 2022 are different in that um, the calendar falls. We had changed intentionally when park met so that they no longer met the day before you all and I had a week to get you all a staff report that summarized all their recommendations so um, February and March are different so this month and next month they will be meeting the day prior to you all so um, I have my notes from the meeting yesterday um, and the builder CE Bachelet is here as well um, and he attended the park meeting yesterday, so he can um, he can help us um, if any of these details I don't get exactly right. Um, so the the park committee reviewed these plans, um, and I am going to flip to the page with all of the elevations on it, so you can see. 
exactly what we talk about. And I can try and zoom in. Um, it, it'll just be delayed. So if there's, if you want to see something closer um, in particular, just let me know. Um, but I'll, if it's okay, I can jump right in with the recommendations that Park had. Um, yeah. and we can go, go ahead and do those. that. Cause yeah, we didn't get a chance to get those ahead of time. That's right. So, um, the, su the suggested, well, there was a concern um, that this, uh, that these plans are very similar to the dark blue home that has recently been constructed on the, uh, on the lot adjacent to this, to the north. So um, the park members made a number of recommendations that um, Mr. CE was amenable to. Um, and, and we think that we have landed on some ideas to diversify the look a little. Um, so on the front elevation, and I'll zoom in. Oh, no, there we go. Um, on the front elevation, the recommendation was made um, to, to the right of the front door. So this area here, um, to add a second story on this level and to add a window. Um, Just to bring that, that so, so right now that wall is set back from the front of the home. Right, so you'll carry the roof line up to match the main roof. That's right. And the second recommendation um, was on the front porch to replace the hip roof with a shed roof. And then the posts to be six by six plain posts these posts that are shown on the architectural drawings are the same as the one next door, uh, ones next door. Um, and then the third recommendation was to have this part of the home um, sided with board and batten, and then the, the other would be um, just the regular lap siding. Um, and then the door. And then the, the final one was to, this is the same front door on the home adjacent. Um, so they recommended that a third glass window door um, be exchanged for what's proposed. And these changes um, were suggested and the vote was unanimous from the park committee. You okay with the changes? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Anybody have any comments, suggestions? So if everybody's happy, let's make a motion to what makes most to approve. Mm -hmm. I'll make the motion. Okay. Is there a second? No, second? Okay. We have a motion on the floor from Jamie Daniels to approve. Fields Gar Scarborough seconded. All those in favor? Nicole? Aye. Jamie? Aye. Fields? Aye. Dave? Aye. And I'll approve it. Aye. Motion carries. Plans are approved. Next item is zoning permit application for change of use at 305 Fernando Street. Um, so I will note that, um, of course, you all were joined by this applicant earlier in the evening. Um, and he um, is not with us, but this is um, relatively simple. Um, the oldest Borland had a basketball game. So, <laughs> um, so I will, that's right. Um, let me try and share. I was just gonna pull up the GIS picture of the end for you all. Um, well, my understanding is there's no change in the footprint or anything. They That's just exactly right. The site plan, so this is before you all because the site plan is not changing. If the site plan were changing, the approval authority would lie with the board of commissioners. Um, so the site plan um, is not being proposed to be changed. And finally, there it is. So um, when, you, when you look at the end, the end is currently permitted um, by our, our bed and breakfast rule, which limits the number of rooms that are allowed um, in a BMB. 
Um, but also the most Western part of the building is, is not rooms for rent, it is a residence. Um, the owners are interested in um, adding more rental units to the property and they would do that by converting the space that is um, their, their, their residence to um, rooms that would be included um, in, their, in their nightly rental program. Um, of course, when they came for a building permit, they would be required to meet all the life safety and um, other rules um, that would apply. But this is just simply to approve the change of use so that they could move, move forward um, and pull a building permit to do that when they're ready. I think it's actually probably a, a more fitting, well, it's change of use, it's not really change of use, just a different classification, but because it'd be the same activity is going to happen there that was happening before, but it's just a, probably a more fitting classification. So I'll go ahead and make the motion to approve. Okay, we have a motion on the floor from Jamie Daniels to approve. Is there a second? I'll second it. Dave Stemple has seconded. All those in favor? Nicole? Aye. Jamie? Aye. Fields? Aye. Dave? Aye. And I will approve also. Aye. Motion carries. Next item is zoning permit application for change of use at 805 North Highway 64, which is was previously a law office. Now they want to make it two apartments. That's correct. So um, the applicant in this matter is here and is the current owner of the property. Um, looks like I, I think that Mr. Harris also has a contractor and an engineer in the room as well. <laughs> um, so this is similar to the last um, application. Of course, um, there is not a um, proposed change to the site plan. Everything would be done inside. Um, of course, um, the, the law office would become two, uh, two apartments. Um, there would be requ some required engineering that between the two units, there is um, the necessary fire separation. Um, and of course there will be um, a, a, a sewer connection fee because the, the use yeah. there will be increased, um, which Mr. Harris um, is already working on with his engineer. So um, I don't know if you all have any particular questions, but I think Mr. Harris is prepared, beyond prepared yeah. to answer if he anything. Want, if he wants to make a presentation, he is certainly welcome <laughs> sure. to. But it's not necessary. It's, it's simple <laughs> compared to what you've been discussing. Uh, my name is John Harris. I'm with Kitty Hawk Kites, and our goal is workforce housing. And uh, that's why we're interested in uh, Mr. Sewell's uh, property. Uh, we want to split it into two residential units. And um, Mike Strader's done the sewage calculations and can answer those questions. And then uh, have a contractor uh, here to answer any other questions also. Um, and that's that's it. We would use it for J-1 visa housing. We use it for college student uh, summer housing um, and seasonal housing and probably wind up with a couple of, with a few year round um, people there. But it's so, so hard to find a space for the workforce. Um, that's, that's where our goal is. Uh, thank you. Much needed housing. Yes. Anybody have any questions for Mr. Harris? Yes, sir. Yep. Yeah. It's one allowed use to another again, right? That's correct. Anybody want to make a motion? I'll go ahead and make a motion. I would. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, we have a motion on the floor. I don't know who made it first, whether it was Jamie or Nicole. Give it to Nicole. Okay, motion by Nicole Northrup. To approve. I'll happily okay. make a motion to approve this project. Is there a second? I'll second. Dave Stemple has seconded. All those in favor of the motion? Nicole? 
Aye. Jamie? Aye. Fields? Aye. Dave? Aye. And I will approve also, aye. Motion carries. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Next, uh, next item is board member comments. Start off with Nicole. I was really happy to approve workforce housing. That was an excellent close to the evening. Jamie. Well, I got something for you. Okay, back to what we were talking about earlier. Um, that density bonus thing has been bothering me, so I looked it up. It says for all, he's right, for all covered developments under this chapter, a density bonus shall be provided equal to one market rate unit or a lot for each affordable housing unit or a lot. That's what he said. So you get for every, you get a, a unit. But then the next line says, under no circumstances may a single family lot contain less than 6,000 square feet. If you divide 6,000 square feet into an acre, you get 7.25, which to me was my always, my understanding was our density is six units per acre, unless you have an affordable housing unit, and then you get seven. If apparently if you had four acres, you could actually get an additional unit. So if you had four acres, instead of getting 24, you would get uh, what, 20, 26, 28. That's how I understood it. That's why when they were talking all this, you get an extra unit bonus on a bonus thing. It was confusing to me, but maybe that's not the way Ben is read, Ben understands the way it's written, but that's the way to me it was meant to be six units per acre. But I understand why would you have six units per acre and then a bonus of one, but then you can come back and get one to one and make it 12. Well, it doesn't the, make any sense to me. What, what he was, what they were doing to get the 34 that they had is what Ben was saying is for the first group of units, you actually have to eliminate a saleable unit for an affordable unit. So you take away X number of units for the X number of affordable units, and then you can add your bonus units to that. But they were just taking the affordable units and adding one more for each affordable unit, and that got them up to 34. Which, yeah, my math is much simpler. It's just six units per acre, and then you can subdivide, make, put seven in the space of six is what it essentially comes down to, and you get to sell your one at an affordable rate, and in theory, you weren't losing any money, and this is going back, and maybe this is not the way, it, maybe not what it says, but it's what I was supposed to say. You get, you can still sell your six at market rate, and you're one at affordable, and you're not losing any money because you're still selling right. six lots in the space that you had six lots. That was the intent. But you know. e either way, whether you do it the way Ben was saying to do it or the way you do it, it doesn't come up to 34. <laughs> <They do it. laughs> and I would say that I think there's an opportunity here to improve the ordinance. Um, and Agreed. <laughs> um, and, and also that that was the note in my staff report is that, you know, I... I think, and it's like our discussion earlier with the land use plan. Um, I think when we when we are looking at subdivisions or single family home lots, we need to be really mindful of how small can we go. And I think that that six thousand square feet is a really good floor. It's pretty small, um, yeah. And and it it provides for a nice neighborhood feel. Um, that Cedar Bay is the best um, example there of that. Um, but I, I think what the ordinance doesn't do and what I had suggested to our land use plan consultants and, and brought up tonight to you all is I think that there is a different standard that it, it's a different bucket in my mind when we talk about multifamily. So that's, and maybe, maybe there's a way to craft the ordinance so that if you're doing a subdivision and that this density applies, and then if you're considering multifamily, then this is how that's gonna work. And this is how, and, and be very specific about how that bonus gets added. Um, because you're, and that was my question is, if we're, if we're allowing a density to be increased, we have to consider 
our our minimum lot size. Well, yeah, this the single the, the bonus density is for single family homes. So they're applying a bonus density to a multifamily complex and, and just ignoring the six thousand square foot. Well, it it's doesn't. Like, I like this little it, piece it, of the it, ordinance it, over it, here. I'm going to take that and apply it over here. Put that together, and that makes sense to me. Yeah. yeah. So uh, in my mind, it needs to be clear about what it is for single family subdivision, and then what it is for a multifamily. And, and I think it's a discussion that the town probably well, needs I mean, to have. Then it wouldn't about apply. It wouldn't, you wouldn't get a bonus. You wouldn't get an affordable. There is no affordable housing for multifamily then. So that applies to single family. I'll look through it some more. In, in cover development. Since you're not busy, we'll talk. <laughs> in cover development, if you go back up to the, to the top of that ordinance, it lists multifamily as a cover development. So the so it it falls under the the requirement of the ordinance, but then later in the ordinance, it's it's not specified the best way how how to apply that. Anything else, Jamie? No, I, I see what you're saying. There is there is there's the twenty percent rule, and then there's the six plus one rule. There's a lot of different. Sounds like a new different different ways you can do yes. it. It's not supposed to be, but I can see how you could interpret it. Yeah, because I I did it one way and came up with a number, and uh, Ben did it and came up with a slightly different number, but none of the numbers we came up with added up to thirty four. You shouldn't be able to get different numbers through different calculations. It's no, but it's written, in, it's written it's in it's written in time for us to simplify and rewrite. It, it's written in very complex legalese. Some attorney earned his money writing that ordinance. And it wasn't Ben. <laughs> <laughs> Fields, you have anything? I'm good. Okay, Dave. I'm good. Yeah. Only comment I have is I just looked at that salt meadow plan Sunday and went through there and added up all the units over top of the commercial space and said it looks like too many and then got out the ordinance and started calculating and you know I came up with 30 not 34 and then I got with Melissa yesterday and she got with Ben and he ran the numbers and he came up with I think 30 also and not 34. So that's where it stands. But uh, that being said, is there a, mo a motion to adjourn? I'll make a motion. Second? I'll second. We have a motion from Fields, a second from Dave. All those in favor of adjourning? Nicole? Nicole, aye. Aye. Jamie? Fields? Aye. Dave? Aye. Aye. Motions adjourned. Nicole, you can have the gavel back. <laughs> oh, thank you. I so appreciate you. Thank you so much, Al.